Um, so yeah, we light the Advent candles. Last Sunday, uh, uh, we had our, our hope candle. This Sunday, we have our love candle. Thank you, Ken and Barb, for lighting that. Everybody say love. I, I hope you enjoy love. I hope it's, it's one that you like. Last Sunday, before we get into today's passage, we heard about a guy named Zechariah. Was Zechariah old or was he young? Old. He was a high priest, and they got news, you're going to have a baby. And Zechariah was struck speechless, literally. Um, he found out that his son, who he would come to know would be John the Baptist, was coming to announce the, the coming of another. Not a prophet. The one coming wasn't a teacher. But the one coming, the one who John the Baptist would declare was going to be the Lord. And this Sunday we're going to hear the announcement of the son of Mary, who we'll see as the son of God. Open your Bible to Luke 1. And we'll go to this first slide. Uh, Ken and Barbara did a great job reading the passage. I won't reread it for you. But you'll want your, your Bible open to Luke 1 uh, and verse 26. What was Luke saying in this, this timeless story? Who here has heard this story before? Raise your hand. Let's just make sure we're on the same page. Who here has heard the story of Jesus is coming, Mary? Yeah. And, and the characters we see at the very beginning of it are Gabriel. Gabriel from, from Daniel 8, Daniel 9. He's a Bible figure. He just uh, told this message to Zechariah. Uh, Gabriel's there. Hi, John. <laughs> and uh, he came to a place. He came to a place, Nazareth. Where is Nazareth, Nazareth at? It's in the northern region of Israel. It's in the northern region of Israel. Um, it is not completely by the Sea of Galilee, but it would be considered part of that region. It's sort of up on a hill. And the people that Gabriel comes and talks to, because uh, Matthew's gospel records this perspective from uh, Joseph's perspective, Luke's gospel records the perspective from Mary's perspective. And they are both of the house of David. Everybody say David. That's going to be important. That's going to be important today. One of the main things that Luke is trying to emphasize is this David idea. But we also learn something else specifically about Mary. It says, and the virgin's name was Mary. So we've got to remember that these people are connected to David, and we need to remember that Mary is a virgin. That means she has not been with a man. That'll matter a lot in a moment. But Gabriel is there to announce things. He's an angel from God. And he gets into the greeting and the announcement. Now let me read this greeting to you. And you guys, as I read this, I want you to tell me, does it sound happy? Or does it sound fierce? Does it sound scary? So Gabriel says this in verse 28. Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Who here thinks that sounds happy? Raise your hand. Yeah. Who here thinks that sounds sad? It sounds good. It sounds good. But what does it say? How does Mary respond to this? She's been told you're favored and the Lord is with you. And it says in verse 29, but she was greatly, what does it say? Troubled. She's afraid. One, I, I personally believe that angels are, are spooky or scary. We don't expect them, you know. As you're going, as you're going on your uh, commute to work, you may expect to see a crazy driver, maybe a school bus. How many of you expect to see an angel? Not too many of us. So she, she's reasonably startled. But also, we read that something else, uh, she, is, she is troubled, but it says in verse 29, and tried to discern. Tried to discern. Uh, and this is, this is different from what we read about Zechariah. About Zechariah. Zechariah is also troubled by the angel coming to him and saying, uh, your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a child. That was troubling for him because they'd been trying for years. They'd given up hope. They're old, and uh, th this can't happen, God. How can this happen? But Mary, we'll see over the course of this story, is discerning and wise. Everybody say wise. Wise. Mary, we'll see, isn't just asking you know, is this, is this a thing that can never happen? She's going to eventually ask, how can this happen? So she's different from Zechariah in that way. And so part of her trouble, she's like, I want to think about this. And then uh, th this is what the angel says. So that was the greeting, you know, you're favored, the Lord is with you. And then the angel talks in verse 30. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a what? Son. Guys, this is our Jesus, amen? This is the announcement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to see today all of Scripture has been waiting for this announcement. 
But Mary has a question. Because he says all these things about who this, this son is. We'll talk more about that in a moment. It all fulfills prophecy. But she says in verse 34, a very reasonable question. How will this be? Because in all that announcement, it's, it's very, you know, there are other times in Scripture, we'll see in a moment, where angels say you're going to have a baby. But it's always Sarah, you will have a baby by Abraham. You know, Elizabeth, you will have a baby by Zechariah. In Gabriel's announcement, Joseph is not mentioned. And so she reasonably asks, angel, I understand biology, how will this be since I'm a virgin? She's just betrothed, she's just engaged. And you can go to Matthew to read Joseph's account of all this and how he's confused and troubled by it. But here, here's how the angel answers her question in verse 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, a really good teacher. Is that what your Bible says? Your Bible says, holy, the Son of God. Church, this is Messiah stuff. This is Jesus stuff. Uh, Mary, as she is hearing this, being told to her by the angel, would understand that this is fulfilling prophecy. This is the one we've been waiting for. And God has chosen me. God has chosen me. And uh, then, then the angel, so he says sort of, in terms of your answer to how, Mary, is all this stuff's going to happen that's super God stuff. But he gives her a practical explanation Remember your cousin Elizabeth? And uh, that word cousin, let's see, where's where that in there? Uh, my Bible says your relative Elizabeth. That's actually probably a better translation um, because who here has a first cousin and you like know their aunt is your, is, or their mom is your aunt? Who here has a first cousin like that? Who here has someone you call cousin and you don't actually know how you're related, but you just call them cousin? Yeah, that happens in Bastrop County. Now we know that, that Elizabeth we know that Elizabeth is of the, 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 the house of Aaron. What house is Mary and Joseph of? Who did we say earlier? David, David. Now, they're all Israelites, you know, so in that broader sense. Um, but there's some connection there. These women knew each other. Uh, Mary must have known somehow that Elizabeth was pregnant. It's, very, it's made very plain here. And he says, remember, your, your cousin, your relative Elizabeth was barren. Now she is not God will do the same for you. And then here's the real promise. Uh, listen to this, church. Verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with who? Let me read that again. Y'all answer louder. Nothing will be impossible with who? God. God. Y'all hold on to that. Jesus, we're going to see, remembers that throughout his life. And how does Mary respond to all this? This is a major teaching point for Luke and his church. Mary, remember, she has been discerning, she's been wise, she's been troubled. She hears all this news, you're going to have a baby. And it says this in verse 38, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your what? According to your what, church? Word. Word. Oh, that's going to matter. And then the angel departed from her. So notice in this passage, Zechariah finds out he's going to have this, this miraculous child, John the Baptist, who he, they never should be able to conceive, but he and Elizabeth will. And, and Zechariah is, is sort of punished uh, for some form of unbelief. So how can this happen? Mary, though, is discerning. She says, I, God, you can do this, but how? How does the biology work? He says, we're going beyond that because you're going to have the Son of God. And the message is delivered. Mary says, let it be done to me. And then the messenger departs. Gabriel is done with Mary. Let's go to this next slide. What did Luke want his church to know or do? The gospel of Luke is written to Theophilus, which means lover of God, one who, one who loves God. And uh, the first thing that, that Luke is really making sure we see, this is where we're going to go back into all the stuff he said about baby Jesus coming. Uh, he, he wants them to, Luke wants us to see that first off, the one coming to Mary, the, the child who will be born of Mary, is a son, an heir of David, which for Luke's people, and it should be for us, should matter greatly. 2 Samuel 7 says this. 2 Samuel 7 says this, and I'll start in verse 11. From the time that I have appointed judges over my people, Israel, 
and I will give you rest from all your enemies. This is Samuel the prophet talking to David the king. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, yes, part of that promise is fulfilled in King Solomon and the rest of, of David's line throughout the, the history of Judah. That household is never fully conquered until the final exile of the people of Judah. Um, but what all of the people in, in Mary's day and Luke's day, they were saying, whoever Messiah is, he will be of the house of David. Church, what household is Mary and Joseph of? David. This is prophecy fulfilled. But also we see this, this, Luke is emphasizing she is a virgin. She is a virgin. She has not been with a man. She even questions as much. And uh, Matthew one twenty three directly connects this idea to this promise in Isaiah. You've heard this passage before. Isaiah 7, uh, this promise is made that there is, there is one coming. Uh, so the situation in Isaiah is Isaiah is, is there before King Ahaz and armies are coming to invade from the outside. And they're concerned, is this invasion going to take years and months and we'll starve and have a bad time? Uh, but then Isaiah gives them this promise, uh, starting in verse 13 in Isaiah 7. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. You ready for the sign, church? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew, in his telling of the story, goes so far as to quote that verse directly. The idea being, now, now they knew that yes, Ahaz has a son, and the, the invasion doesn't last very long, but the people were holding out hope. God, whenever you send Messiah, we know that they have to be more than just a man, more than just a person. We'll talk about that. But more than just a regular person in the line of David. They need to be God with us. They will be born of a virgin. So they had been waiting and waiting. And Luke and Matthew and his telling of the gospel emphasize this point. Mary is a virgin. And then last but not least, the eternal promise that we see in this announcement of Jesus' birth. In Daniel 7, uh, we read this, uh, this vision of Daniel uh, that we have the... The Ancient of Days uh, brings someone before him, and it says this in verse 14, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is a temporary dominion. Is that what it says? No. Everlasting. A king is being promised who will have everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. In church, what we need to see here in Luke 1 is all of these promises are fulfilled. All of these promises are brought forward. Luke is telling his church, you can't miss this. Jesus is not an oopsie. I said last week, was Jesus an unplanned pregnancy? No, he was a very planned pregnancy through all of scripture for all time. But the promise gets even bigger because what it says in Luke 1, 35, your Bible is still there, it says, he will be wholly called the Son of God. Church, say amen if you believe that. Amen. Is Jesus the Son of God? Amen. amen. That, that is amazing. This is Messiah stuff. Mary is, is taking all this in. She is discerning. Well, let's go to this next, this next slide. There's the how. How can this be? How can this be? I mean, I mean Mary, she's going to sing her song next week where she talks about she didn't expect this. How, how could she be the one? Well, first off, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And uh, all this, uh, the, the main point I'm trying to make here with all these is Luke is teaching his church. Uh, the word Trinity does not appear in Scripture. The idea of tr three and one, triune God. But what we see in this passage is at the very beginning of Christ's life, at the very promise of his coming, Trinity is present. The Holy Spirit will come upon her. I have a question, church, in Genesis 1, the, the adult class, the, the class meets in there. They're studying Genesis. Which person of the Trinity hovers over the waters? The Spirit. 
that, that, that God is, is creating by the power of the Spirit. Something is happening here in Mary's life. The Spirit comes upon her, and the power of the Most High. Is God the Father a deadbeat dad? No, He's the perfect Father. He's overshadowing this idea of protecting, watching over, planning. And, and as we heard uh, this morning in the children's message, were there any people out to get this promised Messiah? Yes, and the Father overshadowed. But then the promise, because we've had the ancient days, we've had God the Father, but we've only had glimpses in Scripture. But here in verse 35, we hear the promise fulfilled, the Son of God. They had glimpses of who Messiah would be, how it would happen, but we see that it is a, it is a union and a working of all the Trinity. And like I said before, there's this very practical explanation of how this will happen. You know, the angel is saying it's all this triune stuff, but what will it look like, Mary? Remember your relative, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Elizabeth's pregnancy, you know, she's at six months, should be impossible. It should have never happened. But in the, in the quotation, what he says, for nothing is impossible with God, verse 37, connects to this story from Genesis 18, another impossible uh, uh, pregnancy. Uh, Genesis 18 deals with Abraham. Has anybody ever heard of Abraham before? Father Abraham had many? Amen, amen. So Father Abraham, though, had many sons, but, but there was a challenge. He didn't have any of them until he was old. Any of them until he was old, like Elizabeth. And we, we see this in Genesis 18, 14. This is what the angel is referencing. Uh, Genesis 18, 14. Uh, well, I'll start in verse 13. The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Verse 14 says this. This, this is the Hebrew version. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And he goes on to say, At the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. God said, I'm going to do it. it means he's going to do it, even if it looks impossible. What the angel quotes is more of the Greek version. So in the Hebrew there, it says, is anything too hard for the Lord? It's, it's a rhetorical question. Church, is anything too hard for the Lord? No. And so what the angel quotes is nothing is impossible for God. Mary, this will happen because God does impossible things. Church, do you believe that? See, we, we, we lose sight in these candles and, and, and trees and, and, and meals with our family, which are all good. At Christmas, we celebrate an impossible thing. Emmanuel, God with us, came to save his people. you believe that, church? Amen. Amen. That is the impossible thing that God has done. How does this connect to the gospel? Because, oh, church, this has big connections. Let's, let's talk about that impossible stuff. I'll just, I'll just read from the slides up here. This is Jesus. And think about this. Jesus is born to Mary. That'll come. We'll, we'll celebrate his birth. Jesus is born to Mary at some point, and this is not in Scripture, but, but he's going to talk to her. Tell me about my birth. You know, your child asks you that. So tell me about whenever I was in mommy's tummy. Do you think Mary let, him, let slip at all Jesus? It was an impossible thing. See, I think it was something that, that Mary was able to instruct Jesus on because we th see things like this. Mark 10, 26. This is Jesus talking to his disciples after uh, he talks to the rich young ruler. And he essentially tells the, the rich young ruler, you know, uh, it, it doesn't matter how much money you have. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not giving it up, if you're not giving your life up to follow me, uh, then there's trouble. And he says this to the disciples in 1026. Uh, and they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? If the people who have it all together aren't going to be saved, if they don't get a free ticket to heaven... How does it work? Jesus says in verse 27, he looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Jesus is certifying just as impossible as my birth is, just as amazing as God with us is, being saved from your sin, being saved from your death is just as impossible I think Jesus heard the story about his birth. He asked, Mommy, tell me about when I was in your tummy. And he hears that it is an impossible thing. It's amazing that you're here, Jesus. And even all throughout his life in the garden, right before he's getting ready to go to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, listen to the words Jesus says. 
Mark 14, 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are what? Possible for you. God, I, I know you can do anything. This is Jesus, your Lord, before he takes nails for your sin. God, I know you can do anything. He says, remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Everybody say submission. 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 I think Jesus learns that word from Mary too. I think that that's reflected here too. We see that Jesus in his ministry and his life always believes, always trusts that nothing is impossible with God. Let's talk about favor and grace. Uh, this next slide. So what we see here at the, at the Luke 1, whenever he greets her, he says, O oh, favored one, I'm looking at verse 28, O oh, favored one, the Lord is with who? You, talking to Mary. And then later on down in verse 35, he's going to say the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And, and all this stuff is lifting Mary up. If, if you have an angel coming to you and saying you're favored by God and God chooses you, it, would that be a chance for pride to creep in? To say, well, of course, God, I've been waiting. Yes, I know I'm a pretty big deal. I'm of the house of David. But how does Mary respond to all this? She says, I am a servant. And she also says, let it be to me according to your word. And, and here, here's what Mary realizes that we often don't. And I'll say this thing generally about our lives. And then also, uh, I will talk about the Catholic Church's interpretation of Mary. In our lives, it, sometimes we have God telling us something or instructing us. And like the angel, the angel says, Oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. That word favor means that, that God desires to, to bring grace to Mary, goodness to Mary, and also be present with Mary. Church, is the angel asking or is the angel telling? He's telling. Whenever he says, You will be with child, is he saying, You know, I'm asking or I'm telling? He's telling. And Mary recognizes that's what she's discerning. She's realizing this means the only way forward for me is to serve. The only response that you have, Christian, to God's grace, to, to God saying, I am saving you, I am redeeming you, is to serve and be submitted to his word. You ever heard the song, Jesus, Take the Wheel? Why were your hands on it in the first place? Why were your hands on it in the first place? Be submitted. Uh, and, and Paul affirms this. We see this in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 26. I'll just read from the slide. Uh, Paul says it this way, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are, were wise according to worldly standards. And it, this connects to Mary. Is Mary some religious scholar so holy that God would have to choose her? No. She's of the house of David. But nothing special. Paul says it this way, verse 27, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Does that sound like Mary? Yeah. We'll see in, shortly they won't be able to find a place to stay. They'll be out on the street. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Mary is a servant. Mary does not, desires to be submitted to God's word. See, church, Advent is not a story about how great Mary is. Now, I'll just connect this because some of you may be connected to a Catholic uh, background. Uh, in the Catholic Church, there's this idea that Mary also, it's not in Scripture, has an immaculate conception. This idea that God was looking for one who would be holy enough. And, and that's not what Mary is affirming here. That's not what the angel means by, oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. It's not God saying, I have found you, Mary. I'm glad I have found the holy mother of God. No, just like in our life, God comes to us and says, I am bringing you grace. I am bringing you my presence. Mary is no more holy than we are if we're redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Uh, so here that, that Mary isn't, isn't one who's having her own holiness fulfilled and guaranteed in this story. But what she does display is that God's grace is good, and our response to it, as Mary does, is to be a servant and to obey. To be a servant and to obey. So on this love Sunday, let's not miss this. Unbeliever, and this is the basic truth. I was just talking to somebody about this. I mean, there's all these good things about Christmas, and people can say, I do or don't like it. I hate having the family around. But here's what separates the believer from the unbeliever. 
Unbeliever day, if you have never said Jesus is Lord and Savior, I'll ask you this honestly and openly. Can you believe the impossible? If you say God is a good idea and he's out there and maybe Jesus is a good guy, that, that's not enough. We must believe that God does impossible things. We have a God who, who condescended, and, and I'll do a sermon on this some other time, but uh, God in heaven, Jesus is fully holy, fully in the presence of God. And we will see he condescends. He, he, he limits himself. He's in the womb. He's a child. Not, not because he's learning humility, but because he's getting ready for the cross. God does impossible things. And this means, as we talk about Love Sunday, that unbeliever, the truth is that God has done impossible things to love you. God has done impossible things to love you. What does Jesus say in Mark 10? With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are what? Possible. So, so unbeliever today, if you say, but okay, maybe that's true, but not me. I'm too messed up. I'm too dirty. Does our God do impossible things, church? We have a God who does impossible things. But believer, you say, I believe. I trust. God saves me. God brings me grace. But do you respond to that favor, that love, like Mary? Just a reminder, what does Mary do in verse 38? Uh, she doesn't say, God, you've shown me favor and love. Now do my own thing. You know, Jesus, thanks. I'm glad you're along for the ride. Many of us do that. You know, how many of us, our prayers mostly are, are saying, God, help me with my agenda. Is that how Mary reacts to this? No. She says, I am your servant. Let it be done according to me, to your word. She says, I am a servant of the Lord. So many of us respond to God's grace of being chosen to receive grace and salvation by saying, okay, God, help me with my plan. Mary won't have any of that. Now, I do have to point out, she doesn't just say, I'm a servant. She says, let it be done to me according to your what? Word. word. Oh, this, this side is, listen, they are loud and proud over there. Uh, God has shown you grace. He has given you salvation. Amen? Amen. But, but here's, here's the truth, church. He, he's done all these good things for you, but are you starving yourself of his word? You know, Mary says, the only way I can be your servant is if I am living according to your word. And so this is more for the believer that, that this time of year they feel very empty. They say, I don't feel God's presence. I don't see God's working in my life. Are you starving yourself of God's word? It is, it is good. It is meant to nourish your soul. Mary knew that, and she desired to be submitted to it. So if you feel unloved by God and are denying yourself spiritual food, there's not much we can do for you. Mary desired to live according to God's word. So we see on this Love Sunday in closing, does your God do impossible things? He does impossible things. He does impossible things all throughout the life of Christ and on the cross. And our response is to serve God and submit to his word. Amen.